goal this morning is to explain to you a little bit about what we'll be doing this evening at our annual Boar's Head Festival. I've heard some of the new students asking what's going on with this Boar's Head thing. So I'll just let you know, basically we will be uh, doing a historical reenactment. Imagine. Uh, and the way that it will work is we'll be reenacting a medieval feast that might have happened in Europe during the feudal period, uh, during the time when there were lords and ladies and vassals and knights and that sort of thing. Uh, and this will involve the grand banquet in the grand hall of the, uh, the lord of the manor, let's say, a, a room that would, look, would have looked very much like our own refectory. Uh, we'll have the lord and lady of the manor, headmaster and Mrs. Larocque. We'll have other lords and ladies, acolytes, candle bearers, monks, a jester to entertain all of us, uh, lots of singing, a mummer's play. And a mummer's play is an interesting sideline. The mummer's play is how, in, in medieval Europe, how the news was delivered. Mummers uh, were troops of actors who would travel around from town to town and basically act out the news. There was no CNN, there was no internet. If you wanted to know what was going on, you went into town when the mummers were there and you watched uh, what they did and then you could get the news from various other parts of the world. Our own Boar's Head Festival has four somewhat distinct parts. We begin with a processional in which the, the Lord and Lady of the Manor uh, are accompanied into the hall once their guests have convened by a whole host of servants and other lords and ladies and minor officials and other people who might have been in the hall, including, of course, the jester. In that, we'll have a ceremony in which we light the hall entirely with candlelight. Then we move into a uh, living crash situation where we, we, we depict the first Christmas with Joseph and Mary and the baby Jesus and angels and shepherds and the star of the east. Then eventually comes the Boar's Head procession, when the Boar's Head will enter the hall and be paraded around the room uh, so that we can all see what it is upon which we're about to feast. And then at the end of the evening comes the Mummer's Play, where we'll have St. George and a giant and a dragon and other figures to let us know what's going on in the world at large. Now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking... Well, that's all great, but why boar's head? Well, therein lies the tale. It seems that the first boar's head festival, we don't know exactly when or where it was that's lost to us in history, but we know it was in medieval Europe. We think it likely that it was in England, uh, but I can't be sure. The first boar's head festival took place in either a large town or a small city in medieval Europe, a walled community. We know it was a big enough community to have a college. So there was a walled town and a college, and obviously also in the town would have been uh, the Lord who presided over the town and the surrounding areas and, and those who worked for and with him. And in this college, it was about this time of year, they were preparing as many colleges are even now for exams. And it seems there was a youth who went to college, a young man, not much older than most of you, perhaps the same age as, as the oldest of you, if he was a freshman. And he was studying for exams, as well he might. And he was going to take a philosophy exam, and he was studying specifically Aristotelian logic. He had a book of Aristotelian logic, and he was trying to study in his room. And he was getting drowsy reading philosophy in his room late of a December afternoon, and he decided that he needed some fresh air. And so he decided to get up and leave his room and go outside. Not a particularly momentous decision, but then he decided not only to go outside his dorm, but to leave the grounds of the college and, more surprising, to go outside the walls of the town. In medieval Europe, larger towns had walls for a reason, and there were dangerous things outside the walls of the town. Not so much during the day, but at night it was particularly dangerous. So this student was taking a risk. If he went outside and got lost or lost track of time, he might return and find the door closed and perhaps be unable to get back into town until the morning. 
But nonetheless, out he goes into the woods not far from the town, thinking that a nice scenic pastoral scene of some kind might facilitate his study of philosophy. And he came to an opening in the woods. There was a clearing of sorts, kind of like the area around our own beaver pond. I don't know if there was a pond there, but there, there may well have been. And he thought this was an ideal setting in which to study philosophy. And he sat down at the edge of this opening with his back against the tree, and he started to read his book. Unfortunately, the book was still Aristotelian logic, even out in the woods, and pretty soon he was falling asleep again. And he had just about dozed off when he heard a little rustling in the woods across the way. I was a little bit alarmed by this. He didn't know what there was, and he looked across the way and he saw some movement in the underbrush. His first thought was, this could be a bear. There were bears in those woods. There had even been one on campus earlier in the year. <laughs> but bears are too big. The, under, the underbrush wasn't that high. He would have been able to see a bear, so he dismissed the bear idea. Not a bear. His next thought was, well, perhaps it's a beaver. But they'd all long since flown south for the winter. <laughs> so it couldn't be a beaver. As he was trying to come up with another candidate for the cause of this rustling, and he was noticing that the rustling underbrush was moving in his direction toward the opening in the clearing, he looked and he saw a wild boar step out of the woods into the clearing, and he immediately jumped up. This was not a good plan. Wild boars stink at seeing, and it might not have noticed him if he'd stayed still, but he didn't. He stood up with his back to this tree, and the wild boar saw him, and the wild boar looked at him and kind of snorted and did some of this stuff, suggesting that perhaps he was about to charge. And the youth is now terrified because wild boars are, I mean, they're like this, only all of them. And <laughs> this guy could tear him apart if he wanted to, and it started to move across with increasing speed across this clearing. And he looked to his right and he looked to his left for a big rock or a stick or something with which to defend himself, but there was nothing there. And as he looked back, the boar was right in front of him and leapt toward his throat. And at the last second, the only thing he could do was to shove that book of Aristotelian logic right into the boar's mouth. Well, as it happened, that book of Aristotelian logic was so dry. How dry was it? Well, it was so dry that the boar choked and died and lay there at the youth's feet. Woo! Now, this is good fortune, because not only is the youth still alive, he hasn't been ripped to pieces by the wild boar, but wild boar is a great delicacy, and he knew immediately what to do. So he leaned down, and he picked up the boar and slung it over his shoulder, and he walked back through the gates of the town, but he didn't go to the college. He went straight to the manor house, where the lord of the manor lives, and he knocked on the door of the manor house. Now, you have to use your imagination here. This was not a regular door, such as you and I might see. This would have been a big, thick, wooden door, probably arched at the top, and where you might see a knob, there was an iron ring on it. So just try to picture a door like that. And he's pounding on this door. And some servant opens the door, and the youth says, I present this boar, which I just killed, to the lord of the manor as a Christmas gift with my compliments. And when the lord heard about this, he said, why, there's nothing to do but have a feast. Invite everybody in. We'll have a wonderful Christmas feast with this wild boar. And so all the people of the town and, and the officials of the college, and I hope the youth too, were invited into the manor house for a great feast, which we will reenact tonight in our own refectory. That's the story 